I would like to welcome Sam and Jerry. Hello. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having us. Hi. Hi, Laura. Honestly, so good. Such great discussion. And we already have had some questions come through. So let's get to the first one of those. Do you guys consider yourselves influencers? I wouldn't, but I think Sam would be. Well, I have three boys and it's always scary how much they copy me. So, yes, I'm, I'm aware of it. And if you want to be the kind of influencer that has, say, that million followers, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, wherever, how do you actually get to that place of influence? Oh, I, I don't know. I think you do often have to overshare, I think. Right. Um, share things that you normally wouldn't be comfortable sharing, like, hey, this is me getting a haircut, this is me <laughs> eating a meat pie. So you, you, it's almost like you you got to promote yourself in a way that yeah. often you're not comfortable doing. Yeah, I mean, Jerry, you follow the Kardashians, mm. so what do you think it is that helps them get to that level of influence? Well, I think it's a lot of strategy. I think mm. it's very thought through. So, yeah. um, And, you know, they've got all their other mediums that converge together and it's a whole system, so... I would have no idea how to yeah. advise you on that. <laughs> yeah, it's not actually as random as you like think it might be. And yeah. uh, this is a question for you, Sam, with your controversial uh, comment about sports. Which sport is better, rugby league or AFL? Oh, uh, well, listen, I played rugby union myself. Mm -hmm. I played to the age of 40. I have way more concussions than I can remember. <laughs> it got so bad that by then my wife had to drive me to games because I couldn't remember where I parked the car after each game. <laughs> But all my boys play AFL because okay. they've just won the heart and soul of, of grassroots people. There you go. AFL is superior then. We will take that answer. Um, Jerry, why has personal influence become so popular? Why do you think so many people individually want that level of influence? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, something I mentioned in my talk, what, what modern sociologists think is that because we live such individualistic lives, right, um, that on some level we're searching for people to fill that void and to influence us. Uh, and I joked a bit earlier when you asked me, Laura, about <laughs> whether I consider myself an influencer. Perhaps I'm not an Instagram influencer in the same way, uh, but I can see how I am influenced every day by the people around me mm. um, and how I influence people too. So I think it's just human. Yeah, yeah, we do. We kind of all have that relationship with specific people that maybe speak more into our lives than others. But Sam, this is a question for you now. How do we stop trying to be liked and that desire to belong that you mentioned? How do we kind of find the balance between the two there? Yeah, and it is a balance because on the one hand, you do have to read the room. You can't just say, hey, I'm so comfortable with who I am. I'm going to wear Speedos, even though no one else is wearing Speedos, <laughs> because then you become that guy. You lose all social capital and no one's going to take you seriously. And yeah. you cannot be a force for good if you can't read a room like that. But at the same time, you do have to be comfortable enough to know that, hey, I, I need to have the freedom to be who I am. The freedom of Timothy Keller puts it this way, the freedom of self-forgetfulness. Mm. The freedom of self-forgetfulness. Is that what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you, you can forget about what others think about you, forget about what you feel about yourself and just be comfortable in your identity, your status, your security, your love and your belonging. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, were you going to add something to that? Yeah. I, I was just reflecting on, um, especially when I was in high school, I was so concerned with what people thought of me and whether they liked me. And a diagnostic question since for me um, has, has been to ask myself, uh, do I care enough about what that person thinks of me to make or break my day? Hmm. Um, because it's normal for it to affect you if, if someone likes you or not. I think that's right. Um, but when it, it's got a grip on you in a way that it can make or break your day or you can't stop thinking about it, you can't let it go, um, that's worth, that's worth re-evaluating and, and wondering where exactly you find yourself a sense of self-acceptance and, and mm. security. Yeah. This question, I think, probably fits with that well. I don't have a, a name on it. If you ask a question, add your name, add where you're from, and I'll give you a shout-out. But this person says, uh, or quotes, influence is relational power. Don't influencers simply abuse their power by their constant posting and attention-seeking? How do you tell the difference between a good influencer and a bad influencer? Are there particular things that distinguish between the two? 
Maybe Sam. Yeah, and I love that whole relational power thing. When, when you don't have much power, you do need to work out what everyone else is wearing, what haircuts people have. And, you know, being an Asian growing up in Australia, it was always hard because my mum would wear, make me wear stuff that no one else was wearing. Yeah. <laughs> I would have haircuts that no one else was having. And if, you're, if you don't have any relational power already, mm. uh, that is important. And then the flip side is if, if you're CEO, you can wear whatever you want. So power becomes... Mm becomes very important. So I think it all comes down to motive. Like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I, yeah. again, am I trying to do this for good or is this a power play? Mm. Yeah. And so then maybe to the point of good or bad influences, how would you tell the difference between the two? I think it's really hard to do. It's a parasocial relationship. You don't know these people. Mm. Um, and as helpful as it is to think about power, and relational power, it's probably less simplistic than we like to make it out. Um, I think those with a platform, for example, or people who are leaders, uh, do generally have more power, power than other people. There's, a, um, there's a, a difference there, there's a step up, and they are responsible for it in some way, uh, but being aware of our influence also gives us more power in our hands. Mm. So knowing that we are more influenced than we think helps us to do things like choose who we follow. Yeah. Uh, it, it puts the responsibility and the agency back in our hands. Mm. And both of you are Christian. Your faith has an impact, of course, on how you're looking at this and viewing this subject. And I think this question really taps into that, that side of things. When we are influenced so much mm -hmm. by other people, how can we blame people for the things they do? Like that seems like an ethical thing. I remember as a kid when I learned that my brain was what told my body what to do, I would always say as my excuse, like, I didn't do it, my brain made me do it. <laughs> so in this context, couldn't we say, I didn't want to do this, the Kardashians made me do it. How do we make people responsible for their actions if they're the result of someone else influencing them? Wow, and I think that's where, as it's the whole question of determinism versus mm. personal agency. And I think the fact that we still hold people to high levels of moral accountability shows that as much as we still believe in determinism, that I am the product of what's happening around me, we still believe we have enough individual free will and personal agency to rise above what's around us. Mm. And that's why we give people moral accountability as well. Mm. Mm. When, when I look at uh, the Bible and how it views power, um, I, I see the biblical worldview holding people with a lot of power to high account. Mm. That they do have a, a lot of responsibility. Um, so I, I think there's a real complexity there. Um, and I think, uh, I think it's something for us to think really hard about, especially when it comes to serious issues like abuse, for example. Mm. Um, there is a sense of uh, power that, you know, the more powerful person wields over the other. Yeah. But I think for most relationships where the power differential is a little bit more even, um, there's more room for us to both take responsibility for, yeah. for what we contribute to that relationship. And the great thing about having a two-way relationship mm. is that you can negotiate that. Yeah, it's actually a really good point to bring up. And I think in our current day and age, one of the challenges a lot of people, we all see this, is that you can end up in echo chambers of your mm. own view and then you get polar and all of that kind of stuff starts to happen. So here's a question for you. Should you only follow current trends and potentially be labelled as fickle and shallow or should you actually be following people who can bring a variety, uh, variety of ideas into your environment? Do you go with trends? Do you go with different viewpoints? Who should you choose to influence you? Well, I think the question's already, already leading mm. us to say, well, we need a variety. And the answer is, yes, we do, because as we know, there's more than one way of portraying reality. Mm. So the whole arts world shows us this. You know, if we have a tree, do we go for the photo of the tree, the crayon drawing of the tree, or the watercolour of the tree? Well, the answer is all three give us, gives us a rich appreciation yeah. of the tree. And I think the more perspectives we have, the richer view we have of things. Mm. Mm. And there's a bit of self-awareness in that, I suppose, too. Right, right. I used to be the person who hated mainstream music just for the sake of it. Yeah. Uh, because perhaps on some level I was scared that so many people liked it and that I would be easily influenced. Yeah. Uh, but I think more and more I, I love pop music and there's a reason that it's popular. So um, I think thinking hard about why we, we resist trends, perhaps. Like, I, mm. um, yeah, I, I think... 
things that are trendy can be great. Yeah, yeah. I feel like they can, you know, maybe they'll help you with your next outfit choices. Oh, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just so you know, my accounts. boss, Mark Leong, helped me buy this shirt. We went so in good. person. You've got a personal shopper set. I, I do need, I do need help when it comes to wearing clothes. I love it. No, you've done well. You've both done well. Uh, on the deeper end of the questions, thank you for sending these in. By the way, you can still jump in with your question. If you'd like to, pop a name on there. Uh, isn't it impossible to convert a weakness, the desire to be popular with other humans, into a strength? Isn't that too hard to do? Well, it's to understand, well, what is motivating me? And in the end, it's a good desire. And I'd say it's, it's a legitimate, God-given desire that drives us to be influenced, to want to fit in, because we are social creatures. We do need love and belonging. We do need security. So it's a good reason that we have for, for being influenced. Hmm. I will say some people just have it. You know, some people just walk into a room and everyone's eyes go goes to them. I think those yeah. people are natural leaders and uh, that's a good thing. I think that's a gift from God. And, um, yeah, there's perhaps, you know, that lovely Spider-Man quote, with great power <laughs> comes great responsibility. That mm. continues to be true, but you can use your influence for a bunch of good. Yeah, and Chris has a great question. Thank you, Chris. He says, how do you respond to churches or Christians who are bad influencers? Yeah, and I think for those who have been hurt, uh, this is a very legitimate grief and, and uh, sense of wrong that we feel. For those who are outside the church looking in, uh, I would say, yes, you know, what's been done has been wrong. It's an abuse of power. And again, where do we get this external reference point to judge mm. a church? So in mm. my talk, I was saying, you know, rugby league, arbitrary, blue versus red. But when we see people do wrong, we don't suddenly say, hey, this is arbitrary. No, love should trump hate. Mm. You know, I, I do side with the oppressed rather than the oppressor. Mm. Where's my external reference point? And I say, we're actually holding these Christian leaders to Christian values. Mm -hmm. We're saying your problem is you weren't Christian enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm judging you by the standards of the Christian tradition. And I think actually something you mentioned in your talk probably applies to this really well as well, in that you, as someone who, like you said, grew up in Hong Kong, couldn't be Asian enough, couldn't be Australian enough, Jesus was the influencer that you then drew your sense of belonging from as well. So then maybe with Christian influencers, we take it back to not necessarily being so influenced by them, but more using Jesus as that mm. guiding line of the influence we would actually like to get in our Christian kind of world. Yep. And we have that strong sense for justice. Well, we need someone to right all wrongs. And again, it's, it's, it's the trust that there is a Jesus who will right all wrongs. That's mm. where we get this longing from. Yeah. And uh, Jerry, I want to ask you this question from John in Sydney who says, is it possible for us as individuals to have more than a parasocial? I think that's what you called it. Can we have more than a parasocial relationship with Jesus? Yeah, uh, absolutely. In my experience, that's true. And what I hear from other people who are Christians, that that seems very much to be the case. Um, I think that's because uh, Jesus isn't just someone who uh, existed in the pages of history. And I encourage you to uh, explore and find out what his claims really were. Uh, he continues to be alive, or at least I'm convinced that he is. And so um, I feel like I'm in an active two-way relationship with Jesus. Mm. Mm. And Sam, from your perspective, how do we build that? How do we build a two-way two -way relationship with Jesus? Yeah, it's fascinating that Jesus, with all his metaphors, they're relational metaphors. He says, it's like I'm your brother or I'm your friend mm. or I'm a teacher and you're my student. So they're very two-way relational things. And I think on the one hand, you know, um, we can, we can re hear the words of Jesus mm. through the Bible, mm. but Jesus offers us more. He says, you can actually speak to me. You can talk to me. Mm. And as I mentioned in my talk, he infuses us with his spirit. So somehow there's a spirit of Jesus that talks to us and a spirit that we can use to talk back to Jesus. Yeah, I think that's probably what makes Christianity really unique in that, in that kind of way. And I think this question actually is probably something that a lot of us are thinking about as the, at the moment. As we see Christian quote-unquote celebrities uh, fall, we see them act in less than Christ-like ways, as you mentioned as well. Can we trust Christian celebrities? What is your view on Christian mm. celebrity? Should we embrace it? Should we try our best to dissolve it? Mm. Jerry, we'll start with you. Yeah, no, I've, I've thought a lot about this because um, the... The destruction that recent uh, Christian celebrities have, 
have caused have really been on my mind, really have broken my heart in recent years. Um, I think there, I think what, uh, what's important is that, um, and, I, and I mentioned this in my talk, that the importance of Christian communities around you who you know, um, there uh, are local Christian uh, leaders near you um, who I hope want the best for you and are acting in good faith. Uh, and you can know that because you get to see them in all parts of their lives and you get to see um, their character on the ground mm. in, a, in a way that you don't quite get with a, a celebrity. Um, yeah. I think they're kind of in a category of like an author almost to me. Mm. Um, I want to learn from them. You know, I want to take insight from them, uh, but not in the same way that I, I do with people I walk alongside with and I know yeah. in my life. Yeah, you can't yeah. see their lives quite so close up. And I want to uh, ask you this final question uh, to each of you. From your talks and from this panel discussion that we've had tonight, obviously there's so much richness that you've both offered us, but is there anything that you would really like to leave people with, especially in this conversation about real influences? What would be your last thought, Sam? Oh, wow. Um, on just this security that on the one hand, you're not as important as you think you are. <laughs> yeah. And there's this famous experiment where they made people wear a Barry Manilow T-shirt and walk into a room, much to their horror, and then after the experiment, they asked all the other people in the room, did you notice the guy who walked in with a Barry Manilow T-shirt? Everyone said, no. And so on the one hand, just have the humility that we're not as important as we think we are. Yeah. So just be more relaxed in who we are because in Jesus, we are important. So find out identity and security there. But on the other hand, we're way more influential than we think we are because mm. God has put us in a rich variety of networks. And so we make way more of a difference than we dare imagine. Mm. Yep. Oh, I agree with everything you said, Sam. Um, I think if we're more aware of how we are influenced and uh, allow ourselves to know that we in fact are and not deny that reality, then we actually have more power then to choose wisely who influences us. And yeah. um, I said this in my talk, I'll say it again, you can't go past Jesus. Yeah. You guys have just been amazing tonight. <laughs> it's like, that's it. That finishes it. You can't go past Jesus. It's yeah. so good. But Sam, Jerry, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate all your wisdom that you shared with us. Mm.